Hi everyone, so we are here once more in lockdown. Fortunately, this is only an internal lockdown for us and we're learning last a week. Uh, but what that means is we need to start our next topic in order to be able to cover all the materials we need to for our next controlled assessment, which obviously will be in December time. So this is for unit three and it's topic 1.2. Now, the drawback of doing this virtually is that it is an immense topic. It is a beast of a topic, is this one. So I'm only going to do half of the topic via video and then I'll update the videos at some later date because chances are we can do the rest of it together in class. Um, fortunately, though, it is so interesting. This is what I class as proper criminology now. This is when we really start to look into investigative techniques, don't know if that's a word, um, and we have a look at the, the usefulness of the approaches um, that people take within uh, criminal investigation. So it's a really good one, but it is a big one. So we're only going to do uh, a few of the different elements and then we can do the rest together when we see each other once more next week. So let me make myself smaller. Oh no, that's just moving. That's better. All right, so unit three, topic 1.2, and this is assess the usefulness of the investigative techniques, is a word, in criminal investigations. I also have my tea ready. I have a feeling I'm going to need it for this PowerPoint. So, first of all, I would like you to imagine you're a police officer on an evening shift and you get a call to attend the scene of a crime. It's a report of a violent attack on a man outside a pub. You arrive just as the ambulance pulls up. You see the man lying on the road unconscious. He is bleeding from a head injury. There are a number of upset bystanders nearby watching the scene. The paramedics take the man to hospital. What do you do First, you're left at the scene and a crime investigation team arrives. What evidence might you want to protect, preserve or collect? So please write down what would you do? What things would you look for? What things would you collect? What actions would you take in this situation? If you're struggling, think back to Stephen Lawrence case. We had a really good discussion about what the police should have done. Use that to help you here. Pause it if you haven't quite finished your own list. Did you think of these things? Testimonies from the bystanders. Did you get the immediate responses to what happened? Did you collect their name and details? Any bloodstains, any tire prints, any possible weapons? So bloodstains might be from the individual, the victim, or there might be blood from somebody else. Tire prints, that will show whether the person was on foot or in a vehicle. That shows you what vehicle you should be looking for or whether you should be looking for somebody on foot. On foot means they might be nearby still. Possible weapons, obviously they need to be collected and stored. Footprints, again this will then emphasise um, the size of footprint, what sort of shoes they were wearing, whether again they were on foot or not. CCTV footage. Anything else? Do you think of anything else that you might want to do? Would you watch that clip for me now, please, on the the uh, on how to react to these different situations? Um, I can always send you this PowerPoint so you can get the links as well. That's not a problem. 
This topic then, assess the usefulness of investigative techniques. The reason why this topic is so massive is because this carries the most weight in your controlled assessment next year. It's 20 marks. This is your make or break topic. This will make a significant difference in the grade that you get. You need to be very, very aware throughout this topic. It is an assess topic. What that means is that you must look at the strengths and weaknesses. So remember all the work that we've been doing on things like your critical and evaluative language as well. You need to make a judgment. You need to be able to draw upon the usefulness, the effectiveness, the reliability, the validity, where the strengths, where the weaknesses are, where one thing might be better than another thing and draw those judgments. So that's where you get your marks. You don't get your marks for the description. So it's not the techniques themselves, but obviously we're going to go through the techniques so you know what they are. It's the evaluation that's key. Now please do write all five of these down for me. This is the areas that we're going to discuss in this topic and you can see that the, with the five we have a lot to do. So when we're in the mix of it you can keep going back to this list to see where we are going and what areas you are doing because it does get quite confusing, certainly around the profiling because there's so many for profiling. So we are going to look at intelligence databases, forensic techniques, surveillance, including CCTV, covert surveillance and observation. Those are the three that we're going to do now. So those are the three that we're going to do on this PowerPoint today and what you're going to do for your next couple of lessons before I see you next week. We will then do profiling. There are four different types of profiling. So this is where it starts to get long, heavy and deep, but it's by far one of the most interesting parts is profiling potential criminals. So in profiling, I'm going to look at um, typology, clinical, geographical and investigative psychology. We'll then finish with interviews. So that's our plan for this whole unit. And those are all the elements that you need to make your notes on, please. So please make sure you're writing your notes for all the different elements, just like we would do in class through your excellent standard you always do. And then when I see you next week, we'll then start filling out all grid sheets and putting it all together. You need to think about where they, um, where they are most useful or where they are the most or least useful. Um, so the crime scene, the laboratory, the police station, the street. So where do these techniques work the best? Where do they help the most? The types of crime they help with as well, so they help with violent crime, e-crime, property crime, so these are all things we're going to look at and discuss. In your controlled assessment, you need to link it to the brief as well, so just like last time, you'll get a short story, and all of this needs to be brought in and linked to the brief as and where you can. Um, and so the grid sheet will cover all these aspects, and you'll get your grid sheet next week. So you just need to make all your notes for now. Right. Number one, let's get going. Intelligence databases. I've also tried to label it at the top so you can keep a track of where it is that we are. So our number one intelligence databases. So what are they? They are collections of information from lots of different sources. This information is called intelligence. It has been collected and evaluated uh, to make sure that it's accurate and useful. The police in England and Wales have access to a number of these databases. They can be a valuable way to store and centralise information and to keep records. But as they become more detailed, they can be an important investigative tool as well. So this is basically your log of criminals. This is your database of information, of intelligence that's collected, that's evaluated, that's updated and police can search these databases and many, many databases. They just have access to theirs, they have access to many, many others in, the, in different areas to see if they can get some ideas about who they are looking for. So let's have a look at some of them. So 
These are some of the different intelligence databases that people that we have. The Police National Computer, the Police National Database, the Criminal and the Gangs Matrix and the International Databases. So please jot all of this down because it's really important to know what elements you find within each different one. So the PNC, Police National Computer. Details of arrests, convictions, cautions, fingerprints, DNA, vehicle info, who was driving licenses, disqualified drivers, missing people and wanted people. So this is a huge computer system that has a, an absolute depth of information. The national database has 3.5 billion searchable records of suspects involved in crimes. 3.5 billion. That's immense. Criminal and the gangs matrix, criminals and suspects, those who have had a brush with the law, such as uh, protesters. The gangs matrix stores info about people thought to have links with gangs. And then finally, the international databases. These are international records collected by Interpol, DNA, fingerprints, stolen property, weapons, organised crime and child sex abuse, trafficking, things like that. So there is an immense amount of information to help police in capturing criminals. Sorry, folks, my computer's gone on a go slow today. Pros and cons, then, of intelligence databases. As I've said, this is where your money is. This is where your marks are in your control assessment. You need to know what it is we're talking about, but this is where you have to really emphasise the strengths and the weaknesses. The first strength is that it does allow centralisation and sharing of intelligence across police forces, both nationally and internationally. It can save time and resources to have this at your fingertips. Also, it's become a valuable tool for making crucial links and solving crime. There are lots of examples of this, such as tracing offenders via DNA. So this is a really, really uh, valuable tool um, to, to help criminal investigations you know, get started, um, to draw upon new information and things like that. Problems. It could be problematic if the data is insecure, um, or insecure, inaccurate, apologies. If it's inaccurate, might produce false leads or even miscarriages of justice. The data could be also misused by corrupt officers. So in the USA, for example, an officer used a vehicle database to locate and stalk women. So they have access to so much information that it could be used um, or misused uh, in the wrong way but then you're always going to find corruption wherever you are and is that a reason to get rid of it is it a really good enough reason to stop this um that's such small percent that misuse it versus all of the good that it brings it's worth again discussing considering talking about in your controlled assessment Civil liberties issues, sometimes people only suspected of crimes are on this database. Um, so again, please watch uh, this clip about the use of intelligence databases. Number two, forensics. This is Latin forensis, meaning in open court, in public. So forensic means something is connected with finding evidence to solve a crime. These are a multitude of scientific techniques and methods which can find, collect and preserve evidence, such as fingerprints, shoe prints, fibres from clothes, chemicals like pain, also bodily fluids like blood, semen, saliva um, and Obviously, the cases that we studied in the previous topic in 1.1, 1 .1, um, this the reason why we spent so much time looking at these case studies, like the Meredith Kirch from Amanda Knox case, is because you can bring these now into this as well, where you see relevance. So obviously, they had so much forensic material, but it just it wasn't enough. Also, particles of skin, hair, dust, pollen. These are carefully collected by expert forensic scientists or specialists in ways to avoid contamination, put into specimen bags and sent to laboratories for analysis. That process is extremely important as we found out because it's very easy for a, the defence team to say that actually the, the evidence has been contaminated in some way. So it has to be stored, collected and stored so, so carefully. 
information can then be sent to the police. Forensics continued then. One of the most useful and important forensic techniques is extracting DNA. This is the person's unique genetic code, unless you're an identical twin. This has transformed investigations as it can be a crucial piece of evidence linking a person to a crime. Physical evidence, which can be presented in court and can be obtained from even very tiny traces, um, which is why the Amanda Knox case, Meredith Kirchner, is so frustrated because um, blood is some sort of DNA um, is found on that knife that was at the boyfriend's apartment, um, linking it to Meredith Kircher, but then other people said it's too small a trace, but if there's a trace, there's still a trace. So again, there is difficulties with with using these and collecting these um as much as as you know as far as they can stand up in court so please again watch this clip um, sometimes a perpetrator is detected not because their dna is on our database but because their dna is similar to that of a relative which is on the database now that's extremely interesting so this that what that means is is that people that have never committed crimes before or have been caught or are not on the database for whatever reason if one of their relatives is on the database that they will have a similar genetic material and so because obviously you're still related in some way um, and so what that means is is that they might be able to trace you through your relative let's give you a few seconds to jot that down i'll send you all these links as well to watch to help you um, add more detail to your notes All right, so what I would like you to do now then, please, is a little bit of research. I would like you to research the case of murder, the murder of Colette Aram and the tracing of her killer, Paul Hutchinson. Find out how DNA profiling led to him. I would also like you to watch the programme on ClickView, um, Catching Britain's Killers, the Crimes That Change Does DNA, and answer the questions that I'll send you by email as well. So that's what I would like you to do for our first lesson. If 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 um, there's a bit too much there for the hour and a half lesson, you can, also, you can always do it as an after lesson, but that should certainly keep you going for your first lesson that we are a part. Don't forget to make notes as well. As I said, I'll send you the links and I'll send you the questions that you need for that section. But we're not going to stop there. We are going to start number three now as well. Oh, sorry, no, there's pros and cons of DNA first of all. So um, you are welcome to keep going and just get this whole lot done in one go. Or if you want to stop here... Um, and then do your other subjects and then you can come to this on your second lesson of the week. So this is the second lesson material now. Um, so it's up to you how you want to organise your time. The pros and cons of forensic techniques and use of DNA. It can lead to a very secure evidence, to very secure evidence, factual and incontrovertible. So it, it's unquestionable if there's DNA there, there's DNA there. If it's your DNA, it's your DNA. It, it's fact. Everyone has DNA and it's unique to the individual, highly reliable source of uh, evidence. It can be used to solve cold cases as well when um, when um, DNA is found or when, um, obviously, like we saw in the um, Stephen Lawrence case where those fibres were checked on the jumpers and it actually then led to the conviction being made years and years later. can establish innocence as well as guilt. Even relatives' DNA can be helpful in solving crimes and especially useful for solving sexual or violent crimes as these may result in physical evidence, physical traces being left behind. So there's an awful lot of strengths with DNA in the use of forensic techniques. That's why they're used so prominently. Problems. Um, the David Butler case, he was accused of the murder of Anne-Marie Foy in 2005. His DNA got transferred onto her some other way. His lawyer argued that DNA evidence has made the police lazy. 
we've found the DNA, we've found the person, let's just arrest them. And that they can be then become lazy to look at other avenues or other, other people. Adam Scott, we've looked into the Adam Scott case. We looked uh, into Adam Scott for 1.1, again, for how uh, DNA um, doesn't always work. He was accused of rape in 2011, found to be the result of contamination at the forensics lab. Human error can lead to miscarriages of justice. Again, we're only human. We, we all have a place of work, etc. And however much you try, sometimes these errors do happen. It can be contaminated and lead to miscarriages of justice, can be limited by whether a person's DNA is on the database. It's quite expensive to have it analysed and some object to the idea of a database of DNA. It's a breach of civil liberties, especially if the person is found not guilty. However, since 2012, the data of those not guilty has been erased. So because of this, that if you are convicted of something you are taken in and yet you are then found to be not guilty that information used to be still stored whereas now it's removed please jot all of this down i'll give you a few minutes and then you can just pause it if you haven't quite got it all um i know we've discussed in class um this idea of everyone's fingerprints for example being on a database um, and we had quite a good discussion about our thoughts about whether you know this is a good or bad thing and for me I find it very interesting in that would I be that bothered if the police database had my fingerprints no um, like for example when I've traveled to America and they take my fingerprints and my my retina scans I don't think anything of that I know I'm not a criminal I'm not I know I'm not going to do a criminal act or anything like that so them taking these bits of information from me are not are of no big deal to me um so um the police having my fingerprints for example on a database um wouldn't wouldn't necessarily bother me and if that then meant that people could be caught quicker and that it maybe put people off doing it knowing that they might be caught because they have their fingerprints on um in that database i don't know what are your thoughts maybe pop a comment underneath do you think that everybody should give their fingerprints since fingerprints are unique to the individual as well maybe take it even further should we all have our dna on the database hmm? just a thought Number three, the final one for this PowerPoint that we're going to do today, surveillance techniques. There are three types of surveillance techniques that you need to know about, CCTV, covert and observation. Um, CCTV cameras, one of the most useful tools of modern policing. Um, I think probably in a few years time we'll probably even have um, drones on here as well because obviously drones are now used. I don't know if they're just part of CCTV but obviously dr drones are um, flexible isn't the right word but obviously CCTV cameras are static. They're on that one place whereas a drone can move around an area. Um, it's often the first part of call in an investigation most main streets of major towns and cities um, are now covered in uh, CCTV. A lot of public and private buildings also have it. It is useful because often the filming is 24 hours a day. Some do have dud CCTV though that doesn't help the police obviously. It's particularly useful for property crimes such as the looting um, during the 2011 London riots. So shops having CCTV that showed the, the looters. But often it's static, as I've already said. They only point one way and don't follow people's movements. What that means is they're really obvious. You know where the eye is in somewhere, for example. So you can easily avoid them. You can disguise yourselves, balaclavas, you wear black. You can easily um, disguise yourself around the CCTV. Know where the eye, cover them over, things like that. So they're not foolproof but they certainly still help because you don't always realise, um, you know, how much CCTV there is. We, we started to watch the Dami Lola case before we had to um, close college and obviously they, they could see through CCTV Dami Lola's um, actions um, from school to the library and after the library. So again, it helps to, even if maybe not find the criminal, it helps to understand the, the passage that the victim went through covert this is watching people's actions secretly 
can be done from a distance without them knowing, or you can be a participant intelligence source. This is Covert Human Intelligence Source, C-H-I-S. This is where an undercover detective or informant befriends the suspect or other individuals in order to gain information and feed this back then to the police. So... This is often what is done in drug situations. Um, so it's extremely dangerous, obviously, if they found the person was undercover or anything like that. Um, the, the, the detective puts themselves at a very, very high risk. Uh, but again, this is, this is something that is used. It's not just something you see in films. Can yield very useful information, such as insight into someone's plans and motives. Has been used to foil terrorist plots and drug deals. But civil liberty organisations argue it's unethical, especially taking on a false identity becoming involved in someone's private life. Now, I get it. Civil liberties have to, you know, make people's privacy, etc. But if you have enough evidence that the people that you are dealing with, enough to put somebody's life at risk, a detective to put them in covertly into a trafficking den, a drug den, a gang. Do they really deserve to be protected? Do society deserve to be safe? And therefore, somebody infiltrating that gang, that's the right thing to do. Again, is that is that just my view? But the civil liberty there saying that having a false identity becoming involved in someone's private life uh, so basically catfishing the criminals uh, please don't write that on your controlled assessment um but it, who are we defending here who are we defending are we defending the criminals and the crooks are we defending the innocent civilization the innocent society that could potentially be helped through using covert people so for me i'd write that weakness down but then i would probably maybe do a counterpoint as well but that's just the way that i see that point Undercover police have used names of dead babies to create false identities. So they're actually real people. So they'll have a, a real track sort of thing. Mm, yeah. Um, have become involved in sexual relationships with the person they're observing. So again, you are so involved in that group uh, that you can start to have a relationship. I'm sure that's what happens in Fast and Furious. It's a long time since I've seen that first film, but I'm sure he's a police officer, isn't he? I might have just made that up completely, uh, but I'm sure that's what, what happens in that film, and that's obviously extremely accurate. Um, major controversies, though, have led to strict guidelines for CHIS individuals. So there's a strength at the bottom there because it counteracts the above issues because they know how dangerous it is uh, that there are very strict guidelines on covert surveillance observation this is less planned than covert and then covert a police officer may engage in observation if they spot something suspicious or strange they see somebody out they look a bit dodgy I'm just gonna follow them i'm just gonna observe them see what they do they may remain close and watch to see how events develop. So this again is quite common. This is what this is what police do. This is they spot something that they think is suspicious and they just observe. So that's a very common thing. Right, over to you then. I would like you to investigate the case of Colin Stagg, suspected of the murder of Rachel Nichol in 1992. What does the case show about covert surveillance as an investigative technique? Uh, and again, watch the documentary below and answer the questions I'll send you by email. So what does this case show you? What does what do you learn about covert surveillance, etc.? Um, and then watch that clip and answer the questions. Also, I would like you to research the case of David Butler and Adam Scott. Adam Scott, you've already done uh, for your DNA previously, so you'd have to do more from that. Um, but you do might just want to jot down to, you know, in your notes to see the Adam Scott information that you had on how DNA evidence does lead to problems. So the top one is about... Um, uh, the top one is about your surveillance, where that one then is about more the DNA um, uh, as well. And then finally, I want you to research the James Bulger case. So we did this, or I think I mentioned it last lockdown, um, the James Bulger case um, and how CCTV helped this case, but also any drawbacks. What are the drawbacks 
of CCTV. What are the drawbacks, other than the ones we've just done on the previous slide, um, of how it was used in the James Bulger case? What are the problems? Because, yes, it did lead to the boys, but there were a number of issues with it still being right back in 1993 or whenever it was. All right, so yes, we are going to stop there for now. That's your two lessons worth of work. I will send you all the clips, all the sheets via email. You just need to watch this, make your full notes like you normally do, and then we'll see where we are next Tuesday when we come back together again. Um, we'll have some grid time, uh, grid sheet time uh, together, and then we're going to have a go at doing some of the profiling techniques because, again, this will need to be done over the summer holidays if we don't get it done. I will be doing a video on four and five at some point, so I will be doing a video for profiling techniques and um, interviews to help you but for now that's your two lessons set any problems or questions just email me drop comments down below that's absolutely fine um, and I'm also going to do a try and do a few more videos as well just to help you during this time so I'll send you everything that you need uh, via email Otherwise, thanks so much for watching, folks. I hope um, you found that interesting. I hope you enjoy the clips that you're going to watch. And um, I will see you all, see you all soon. Bye for now, guys. Bye.